Natural Order Podcast, Episode 11. Welcome to the Natural Order Podcast with your hosts, Ryan O'Leary and Adam Heyman. All right, welcome uh, back to Natural Order Podcast. Brian O'Leary here with you with Adam Heyman, as always. Welcome, Adam. Well, thank you, Brian. How are you doing? Doing well. All right, today we wanted to talk a little bit about, you call it the vibrancy of society, the institutions that create this vibrancy without the need for government involvement. Yeah, we were talking a little bit in a previous episode about the distinction between society and government. And so I thought it would be interesting to sort of flesh out all of those thousands of private institutions that make up a vibrant society that aren't government. Um, because a lot of people, like the the standard knock on libertarians is that they're just all individualists. They want an atomized society. You know, they don't see the need for social organization, which is, of course, nonsense. Well, not entirely nonsense. A lot of them are that way. Well, I mean, I guess you can have autistics who don't understand their own philosophy in any group, but that is not the, the canon of libertarian political philosophy. The hermit on an island is not the ideal. That's, that's insane. <laughs> but nevertheless, there is this, this tension in, in our modern society consciousness that absent the relations between people that are formed by government, we wouldn't have relations between people, or they'd be weak, or they'd be insufficient, or something like that. So I thought it'd be very interesting to talk about how that just ain't so. Hmm. So we're talking like mutual aid societies, like Knights of Columbus type thing. and um... Yeah, there are zillions. And just, right. to, just to frame this correctly, it's axiomatic that the smaller the size and scope of government, that means the larger is the size and scope of all of our private institutions and associations. You know, that's just math. There's a very real crowding out effect. The more the government taxes and regulates, it is crowding out all of the private arrangements that would be made absent that. Mm -hmm. And Americans used to sort of know that, right? I mean, Alex de Tocqueville, the, the French aristocrat who was so enamored with America, talked endlessly about America's almost uh, instinctual tendency to form associations. He, he wrote about it. I've, I've got a couple quotes if, you, yeah. if you'd like to hear them. Yeah, yeah. Um, this is Alexis de Tocqueville. Americans of all ages, all stations of life, and all types of disposition are forever forming associations. In democratic countries, knowledge of how to combine is the mother of all forms of knowledge. On its progress depends that of all others. And then there's another, which our modern ears should, this should sound familiar, uh, de Tocqueville. The more government takes the place of associations, the more will individuals lose the idea of forming associations and need the government to come to their help. This is a vicious circle of cause and effect. Yeah. Well, I, I have a comment there when, I, when you were reading these quotes. I, I wrote down something like fire departments weren't always government run, for instance. They were associations uh, uh, within the community and went all up and down. Like you could buy fire insurance and then there'd be people willing to be part of the fire department. And then, like you're saying in that last quote, government just took it over. I don't know that it's better. I would generally say that, uh, yeah, if we had a private fire department, it that would be better. But, you know, the fire department is frankly like one of the better parts of these municipal governments that is great and and you know just because i have a bunch of friends in fire departments and uh, i think they have the, probably the least amount of waste and mo most amount of work but if that was available in the private sector i think it would even be more robust and we get more out of that of course i agree with you compared to things like the rest of politics and the police department for example Fire departments aren't nearly as awful and corrupt as those other inst government yeah. institutions, but nevertheless, they are subject to the tragic incentives of a monopoly. As the consumer, you are going to pay too high a price for too terrible a product, a service, than you would get if the market was free. There's just no way of getting around that fact. So we should be 
we should be thankful that the fire departments tend to be not awful, but it's almost a guarantee that they would be better, yeah. on, at least on average, if they were private. It's weird, though. I don't know if we wanted to go down this road, and I, I certainly hadn't prepared <laughs> to go down this road, but with the fire department, I'm just saying, I like I have a, a bunch of people that I know that are in the fire department all across the country. It's a different kind of guy. They're good upstanding guys for the most part i wouldn't say that about a lot of other bureaucrats some of them yes some of them no but well they're not bureaucrats these are guys who are willing to run into a burning building and save you i mean obviously the job by its nature is going to attract heroic people yeah yes absolutely well let's not get hung up on specifics yet we'll drill down a little bit um you bet but uh mutual aid societies used to proliferate all across the country they were oriented around specific types of vocations or avocations, frequently uh, situated on a specific locality, but not always. Some were regional or nationwide even. And of course, the most basic of non-government institutions are the family and the church and used to be the school, which is making a comeback, by the way, private schools. Um, Americans formed private institutions and still do for all manner of reasons, social, charitable, to accomplish various goods that are desired locally in the community. And uh, I mentioned churches in there, but even the non-church ones tended to do the, the types of things that churches would do, just absent, you know, being yeah. oriented around a specific religion. And it's very powerful. Yeah, and I wouldn't call things like Little League or Pop Warner football necessarily mutual aid societies, but it's kind of s- similar to what we're, we're talking about. It's an, another way for folks to have activities outside of the government sure. school. When sure. it comes to the vibrancy of society, the associations don't need to be mutual aid. They can be the chess club. <laughs> they yeah, can yeah. be pop yeah. Warner football, right. you know, whatever. Right. It's just that we used to get that, of course, humans want to congregate to accomplish things, to enrich their lives. It's mm-hmm. just a crying shame that we've We've been hypnotized into thinking that you need a, a law to make that happen. You need a government body. You need a, a formation of some council sanctioned by government. It, it, it's a shame. Yeah, I, I would argue that it, people have generally lost kind of the beacon, that North Star, if you will, of what freedom actually is. Right. And without that shining example up there in the, the metaphorical sky, people don't know where to point. Well, when it and, comes to, uh, no, go ahead, Brian. Yeah, no, I, I was just going to say, it, it's, it's just kind of sad to me that because of, like you're saying, the state taking over most of our institutions over the last, well, I mean, it started out as a nice, kind of nice idea, but really over the last 250 years, uh, they've taken, they've slowly crept in and taken it all over. Yeah, and it's not just government that did it. It was well, people acquiesce because it's easier. It's easier. It was a change in um, psychology. I mean, our culture degraded, or maybe they just shifted focus. But I mean, I don't know. You're, I don't know if this jives with your own upbringing, but I remember pop culture treating the concept of private societies as a joke. I mean, you remember the Flintstones and Fred's interactions with the Grand Poobah of the. Loyal yeah. order of water buffaloes. The water buffalo, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I remember that, and I was, I don't know, I was obviously young when I started watching. That was probably my first introduction to what a, a private association is, and it's a freaking joke, <laughs> you know? They were making right. fun of- The a, bowling club, and- They were making fun of the Elks Lodge, and the Freemasons, and the Shriners, and the Moose Lodge, all organizations well, that are a lot of those, yeah. still around today, by the way. And I think- Richie Cunningham's dad on Happy Days. He's a Shriner, wasn't he? He was the Grand Poobah of the Leopard Lodge. Leopard Lodge oh. number 462 in Milwaukee. I looked it up. <laughs> and I don't, I barely remember that show, but I'm pretty sure even that, uh, old Howard was treated as a bit of a joke for this men's club that he went to. Yeah, well, he had a, the, the Fez. I remember the Fez. Yeah, right? the hat, the funny hat. Those are associated with the Shriners, I think, mostly, right? Yeah, right. That's why I said that, that's why I asked if he was a Shriner. But uh, yeah, the, they they probably with these things, uh, the show, the shows anyway. They well, uh, humans want community, and so they form these associations. And again, in the past, they used to do a lot of the things that modern Americans think only government can provide. 
uh, getting things done, local projects, charity. But again, the, a lot of these old ones are still around. Uh, we mentioned a few. There's also, uh, you know, the Rotary Club, the Toastmasters. I would include the VFW, mm-hmm. Veterans of Foreign Wars. Yeah. And I think we would do well to reorient ourselves towards returning to these private associations. And, well, the, the and by American the way, Legion I think we are. Too. Yeah, the American Legion is one that's dying, but uh, it was, they. I, mean, I just come from a baseball background and our you just played Legion baseball in the summer, and that's what you did. They they sponsored a whole league across the entire United States of baseball. And the more you dig into it, I, I mean, I, I, I never actually was a part of the American Legion. I think I could have been by being involved with the baseball part, but it, they have some things that I'm not entirely congruent with. But they run a pretty darn good baseball program, and uh, there's— You upset about the designated hitter rule, Brian? Personally, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just took a stab in the dark. I don't know baseball. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. So, they, I mean, they do other things, but they're probably most known for uh, the baseball and the people that are really involved. They're involved in baseball. And they have the Legion Legion halls and stuff, and which, gosh, going there, man, they, they get food and drink for free, and all these guys get together and, you know, tell stories and do whatever. And it's just a like a, a really, like a private way of celebrating American culture and friends. Pretty yeah. Cool. Thank heavens the government hasn't crowded out all forms of uh, private associations. And again, uh, I think they're making a bit of a comeback because of the lunacy of the last handful of years. But before we get into that, I wanted to read another quote, if you uh, okay. if you yeah. indulge sure. me. This is one from a guy named David Beito, a senior associate fellow of the Heritage Institute, or he was in 2000 when he wrote this. And it it discusses the history of, of private associations. Here goes. Here's Beato. A fraternal analog existed for virtually every major service of the modern welfare state, including orphanages, hospitals, job exchanges, homes for the elderly, and scholarship programs. But societies also gave benefits that were much less quantifiable. By joining a lodge, an initiate adopted, at least implicitly, a set of survival values. Societies dedicated themselves to the advancement of mutualism, self-reliance, business training, thrift, leadership skills, self-government, self-control, and good moral character. These values, which can fit under the rubric of social capital, reflected a kind of fraternal consensus that cut across such seemingly intractable divisions as race, sex, and income. And it is worth noting that the women who belonged to these societies regarded themselves as members of fraternal rather than sororal societies. Hmm. For them, fraternity, much like liberty and equality, was the common heritage of both men and women. That's French Revolution junk right there. <laughs> it doesn't have to be. Any good idea can be perverted, Brian. And, uh, <laughs> and oh, and before we disparage the French, we can't forget about good old Alexis de Tocqueville, right? Yeah. Does he have more? You have more of. Uh, and Frederick Bastiat. Yeah. Well, it, interesting. You brought up. Uh, I mean, with a slew of stuff, you brought up uh, orphanages in there, and I had something to say. Like orphanages and adoption was generally all privately run, oftentimes by the church. By the church. Or, uh, yeah. Or something similar. Because. But. I'm sorry. Yeah. To, I'm sorry to interrupt, but but because look at the mechanism by which that occurred. Humans in a society saw a need, abandoned children, orphaned children. And so what did they do? They congregated amongst each other to try and solve the problem voluntarily. They didn't just reach for the for a gun and try and force somebody else to, to do something. They they did it themselves. Essentially solved the problem, right? And and then you have the problem of, you know, orphanages being just like you're saying, like the uh, the Flintstones example. It became a joke. I don't know if it's because of like Little Orphan Annie or Daddy Warbucks or, you know, like this whole thing, like, oh, it can't really happen. These people are living in squalor and the people who run them are like evil people. But because Carol Burnett, frankly, uh, she frightened me as a child <laughs> from her role, from her role as the, 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 the orphanage keeper or whatever. I like it scarred me for life. I didn't realize how funny she actually was. But I realized she just turned 90 years old recently. But um, anyway, point being is that the state, in the, well, here in the United States, I think even really the 
the federal government has more or less taken over adoption to a large degree, where it used to be adoption was done really with, I mean, frankly, the people I know, uh, through the church, essentially. I mean, you got to have like some sort of certification from the state or wherever you are, but now it's uh, they're putting so many restrictions on the facilitators of adoption that people don't want to do it anymore. That's why they go to foreign countries and bring back kids from foreign countries. It's so sad because there's need in the United States. Not to say that there's not need elsewhere, but they make it so much harder for Americans to adopt Americans, which that needs to be done. And I'm a real believer in it. And But they people, to make it easy, if they want another person in their family, another child, they go overseas. Yeah, it is a shame. And the government did what the government does. It, inch by inch, crept in and swallowed the whole thing. First by a regulation or two, and then a, a whole sweeping swath of regulations. And then once they've choked the life out of the thing, they go, well, look, the government really needs to provide this. And so they just take over. Yeah, first gradually, then all of a sudden. Exactly. Um, yeah, breaks my heart, the, uh, the children thing. But there is a light at the end of the tunnel um, between the connecting power of the Internet and the horrors unleashed upon us by the reaction to COVID, the lockdowns, the mandates, this, all the horrible things that were done to us. I, I think these mutual aid, private associations and societies for, for all sorts of reasons, not just not just charity, I think they're making a huge comeback. Before we went on the podcast, I looked into it a little bit, and there are a lot of groups of people gathering together for positive means outside of the state. I'd be interested in the, the number. I, I, I believe you as far as making a comeback, but I think the <laughs> it was so shattered before this that... That it can only grow, I think, after this last three years. Well, remember, yeah. remember, the system is evil. Government control is evil on a, a whole variety of dimensions that we can go into. Mm -hmm. And because of that case, because that's the fact, um, the thing that's not evil, the good association, is going to make a comeback. It can't help but it. Um, one obvious example is how disastrously the government has screwed up the provision of health care in this country from state um, interventions to federal interventions. It's gotten worse and worse and worse. And then when Obama gave us uh, the Affordable Care Act in whatever it was, 2012, you know, what was already poisoned by government regulation was trebly poisoned. And in response to that, we have these private uh, health cost sharing organizations popping up, lots of them. The, the first were oriented around religious institutions because the church is still strong in America, thank God. I'm, I'm one of the few atheists who really sees a value to our culture in having strong churches because they're private. I mean, if for no other reason, they're oriented towards what they conceive of as the good and they're private. So thank God they're healthy. Um, and then there's that product that uh, mm -hmm. your friend of mine, Tom Woods, um, is always promoting, uh, Crowd Health. You know, that's that's not oriented around any religion, but it is a private way to distribute unexpected uh, health costs across a group of people who are who have the same vision about what this should be. And they're not interested in the state mandates, the crony mandates by which 40 or 50 different things are forced into your insurance by law that you do not want to pay for. Well, I just speak, speak from personal experience that like we, we keep getting lower and lower tiered packages that cost more and more. And last year, they we had to go through a whole new company because the company we were with said, no, we, we can't even service you anymore. Basically, basically, you got too many kids or something like that. I don't even know what it was. We talked about the orphanages, right? I mean, what the government does is it poisons your private institution until it's so crippled it has to take it over. And then it says, look, yeah, see, without us, <laughs> you know, what's that old adage? The government breaks your leg then hands you a, crutch, a pair of crutches and says, see, without us, what would you do? And they did the same thing with healthcare. I believe the point is to cripple it so poorly that they're eventually going to push us into a, a single payer socialized healthcare service like like Canada or Britain. Sure, what it lo what, it, what it looks like. Uh, I think that it takes people like us and our our show for people to revolt against that. And be, you can't like, I mean, you could take up pitchforks in the street. <laughs> Light things on fire, but that's uh, next year, that's, Brian. That, that's next what year. that's what they do. Uh, <laughs> what we do is we we go to places like Crowd Health, and 
stuff like that where we take our money to these institutions that actually help us prosper. Yeah, bottom up is a glorious vision. Sometimes in my mind I think of a I think of the government as a concrete pavement, you know, mm-hmm. parking lot laid over a, a beautiful meadow or something. But as oppressive as that thing can be, what happens is it it sucks, so it cracks. And what happens in the cracks? Well, life starts to emerge through the cracks. And I, I think of these private associations as like that, as fractured as the government and its private or its uh, its public institutions are. When it cracks, as it must, because the institution is unsound, well, then the you know the flowers burst through the the cracks in the in the sidewalk, and and they call us weeds every time, but we're flowers, damn it, Brand, we're flowers. <laughs> I was gonna say that's uh I don't see many flowers popping up through the the cracks there. It's, it's all weird trees that are that are uh, really. Well, well, I'm telling you, I think people are waking up. You can't call. Yeah, a quarter of your society non-essential and make working illegal. Not just taxed, not just fined, like the IRS does. Illegal. Was it only? It was it only. I don't know. I'm just making that number I mean, up. It, it was a it lot. It certainly felt like more. It certainly felt like more. Uh, yeah, but yeah, you're right. You can't. You, I mean, they can, you can't. They did. That, but it ain't right. <laughs> it ain't right. And since it isn't, it will fail. Um, and and shows like like this one. And there, there are lots more of them, you know, more and more these days as the mask falls. Um, the, the, the lie that government is just here to help us, um, people stop believing the fairy tale. And when, the, when you stop believing that fairy tale, don't despair. All the quote-unquote good things the government gives you, well, those were the, the stunted version of those things. The healthy version is brought to you by private institutions and associations And the desire for humans to form them is part of our DNA. It's hardwired into us. We evolved as groups to to accomplish things jointly. And if we can just get the goddamn government out of the way, we can start to form these bottom-up, vibrant societies that guys like you and me, Brian, we like to talk about. Yeah, I I think it's... I mean, we rail against the government all the time, I do, and... Uh, I don't know that it's just the the government in general. It's the particular forms of government that uh, we've had, and uh, I, I I'm I'm hopeful that you know I I think we need like we've talked about in the past we need hierarchies and such. But the way the way government functions and it and it's called government, uh, yeah, it, it does it doesn't really work uh, for a, a healthy prosperous society which we're trying to accomplish. And, and I think you're right about the fairy tale thing. A, a lot of people believe the fairy tale still, and we're, we're still stuck in this land where people believe the fairy tale. We're telling you, I mean, we're tell, telling you Santa ain't real on this show, and which is kind of sad for, uh, for some folks. But uh, Well, remember, um, it is. the reason they believe... Th- the fairy tale is because government seized control of the schools over a hundred years ago, and it is in their nature to indoctrinate this particular fairy tale. I mean, how weird is it? As Tom Woods says, you know, if the Walmart ran the schools and you saw up on the top of the ceiling, you know, pictures of past Walmart CEOs that the kids can, you know, swear allegiance to, it'd be creepy. Well, well, that's what these government schools do right. with the portraits of presidents and whatnot. So yeah, of course they push yeah. the story that only government can accomplish good. It's it's literally in their interest to do that. <laughs> and, you know, eventually you and I Brian will get around to discussing school choice at some point, but, but that again, that monolith is cracking too. It's cracking cuz people have had enough of it. And yay, yay for that. <laughs> Decentralize, please. Yeah, I mean, I guess I mean to touch on that school choice thing, which I I think we have planned to get to in, down the road, but I, I mean just to touch on that, there you, know, you talk about private associations and, and stuff like that. There's homeschool co-ops and stuff that people are doing now uh, I, that I see. You know, we're we're not really in that market to do it. Uh, and certain communities are better served for that. And I think it's just a, a matter of the place and the people involved in the community. That's a that's a really big thing with all this stuff. And I think as, well, I, I would say I, as a, growing up, I, I lived in Oregon all my life. 
uh, and I thought of myself as an Oregonian. You know, my family had moved in there over the decades before I was born, and I just saw Portland change so much because the people changed, or the new people came in from all over the place that really weren't what I call what I would say Portlanders. They didn't have the same ethos as we did, or at least the impression that I had. And now the place has gone to crap. You wonder why. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, as you were just speaking there, I was reflecting on how different geographical ways of life, you know, like a fishing village is going to have a different ethos than a mountain town, which is going to be different than a prairie and farming. Yeah. So it's interesting, you know, just right. trying to think about the ethos of Oregon or the ethos of Nevada, for example. And, uh, and it is weird. In a sense, that structure can't ever disappear any more than the geographical uh, traits can disappear. But then when people come in with these super strong, really invasive political ideas, it changes the culture so, so much. Yeah, because they got, I, I think essentially what happens, or at least what I've seen, is you have people coming from elsewhere in the country and they move west. I mean, that's the history of our country. They just keep moving west. And eventually they hit the coast where you can't go much further. But they they've been kicked out of their communities or because their community they think is so, uh, you know, I don't know what what it might be, but they're they're looking for a fresh start, which is fine. But people let them tread on, you know, people don't tread on me. No, the treading happens because the these people with these odd political ideas just infiltrate these uh, spheres of power i did a podcast the other day as you're hearing this uh, um i don't know when this will come out but uh, i just say there's so many unimpressive people that exist in these power centers uh, of our culture they're just really unimpressive people but they they have the power <laughs> and so what do we do about it it's like well i don't know there's only one solution there's only one we could have sympathy for unimpressive people if they didn't have a power structure to climb into and wield that over us like a club. So what's the solution? To shrink that. If you want these private institutions and associations to grow, you have to shrink the thing that crowds them out, which is government. And so that's the vision. That's the only way to do well, it. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if that, sh that shrinking is uh, practical. I, I think elimination... Which I always vote, which I always vote for. I vote for, I, I do the write in and check the mark says eliminate position. I need more people when they fill out a ballot to join, <laughs> join my side and do this. I mean, I think that is a really, I mean, the only way to do it. You say shrink. The system is in place uh, to grow, or it's not in position to shrink anymore. It's just well, like, I think it, I think it has to shrink. And when I say shrink, I mean eliminate. I mean eliminate certain provisions or certain elements of it. But you, you can't get rid of it all at once. I wish we could, but that's just not. It's it's like the weeds and the flowers and the sidewalk. The weeds and the flowers can't destroy all of the concrete all at once. It happens little by little. Everything is gradual. Um, and if it and if it wasn't gradual, it would be cataclysmic. I mean, as much as I hate everything the state does, if you turned it all off, literally turned it all off tomorrow, there'd be a tremendous shock. Well, that's why they've that's why they've succeeded too, because they just like slowly ratchet. It's like the old uh, frog in the pot of water. That's exactly right. And although that old libertarian question, if there was a button that would eliminate the government in all its forms immediately, would you press it? And yeah, I would. I'd blister my finger pressing that button. But I, still, I have to admit that the that the better way is the Ron Paul way, a gradual elimination. You know. You eliminate the empire first, and then you work on the Federal Reserve, and then you start working on domestic policies. But you can't get rid of everything all at once. Well, it's interesting now when this new presidential cycle is heating up again, and you know the typical, I guess, Republican position is they 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 rail against the government overreach, and and then they end up end up not doing even anything worse. About they it. ratchet up government themselves every single time they're given. The, the power to do so. <laughs> yeah, Give them right. the presidency and both right. houses of Congress. They increase the size and scope of government right. just like the left does. That's why they cannot be trusted. Yeah. Well, right. they are the left. I mean, that, well, what I they would, are is status. They have they, their own vision of how, what kind of big government should be. And so they, they, they impose that every time they get the chance. Yeah, but my point, my point being is that, you know, th there's people that, like Ron Paul, if he were to be elected, 
he talked about eliminating several just cabinet departments mm-hmm. altogether. That's not a bad thing. And that could happen immediately, and nobody would be. I mean, just a bunch of bureaucrats lose their jobs. The system would be fine with that. And, you know, like if if the Department of Education, for instance, uh, were to all of a sudden not exist, that, I think education would improve, I mean, the, the, frankly. That department hasn't been around that long, right? It's yeah, Carter the 70s for crying out loud. We don't need it. And, again, thank God the school choice uh, movement is taking hold. You know, parents are starting to wake up that not only is it not true that you could not have kids being educated without the government, the government being involved actively retards, <laughs> literally, the process of educating your children. And if the school choice movement keeps going at the rate that it's going, I mean, we could see the elimination of the Department of Education in less than five years. I mean, <laughs> yeah, but the right the right folks have to be in power and it's not necessarily a Republican. I don't think a Democrat's going to do it, but most could Republicans are going to do Remember, it Remember, Carter killed the uh, what was it? The Civil Aeronautics Board. I mean, when conditions are right, even even the left. Yeah, kills regulations. he was a, he was he was a Democrat. He was a Democrat in the right, 1970s. That's a whole different animal, right? Way different, way different <laughs> than the Democratic Party of 50 years later. <laughs> like, uh, I mean. I, I would like to say, and I, I would even, I mean, let's, if we're going to get into this right now, might as well. But I, w- I would say that even 20 years ago, 25 years ago, I, I'd have faith that maybe like if a Democrat got into office, he would do that. No, There's not, no not, way. Not now. There's no, no way. Now. So what my, my point being is that there you got to you got to Republic. Not all Republicans will do it. And only certain ones. Uh, Trump talked a big game, ultimately fizzled out. DeSantis talks a big game. We'll see. I don't know. Those are the only two. Those are the only two possibilities, I, as far as I see. I know nobody else on the stage has. I mean, maybe Rand Paul, but he's not going to run this. Yeah, time unfortunately, again. I don't see anyone. Dave Smith, he'd do it. My vote will be cast for either Dave or Spike or whoever. But uh, yeah, we've wandered far, far afield from our topic. But <laughs> it is interesting that as as crazy as the left gets, and as obviously hypocritical as the right is shown to be which is what's going on in modern times, these people are fleeing their former parties and they're looking at libertarianism as, oh, hey, maybe that consistent approach, uh, maybe that has some virtue. Maybe it was a mistake to try and force my will upon half of the country that disagrees with me fundamentally. Oh, maybe it is better if we just leave each other alone, at least by political means, and associate with each other by voluntary means. That's better, folks. Wake up. It's way better. (laughs) No, I I agree. I I think there's so many people out there that are looking for another way. Amen. I was was seeing uh, a few months ago, I want to say, and I'll have to see if I can dig it up. There was a long Twitter thread about the demographics, the political demographics, the what what party you were in within each. I believe it was county or precinct or congressional district uh, within the state of Oregon. And it was remarkable to me how few people actually were registered in any one particular uh, political party. Now, in the urban areas, the Democrats, almost 90, maybe even over 90 percent in certain areas. In the rural areas, it was probably uh, it wasn't flipped, but it was um, certainly Republican dominated. But a lot of places were like dominated by no party affiliation. That's true of Nevada, frankly, in Nevada. Yeah. And it was it was. I didn't I didn't realize that. But the narrative is it's Republicans versus Democrats. No, it's the it's a person that wants something different and they don't get it from either yeah, of those guys. People on mass haven't figured out what the solution is, but they are starting to wake up to what the problem is. And then the libertarian share in most of these places was minuscule. It still is. But independent yeah. and nonpartisan, non affiliated. That's the thing that's growing. That shows disaffection the with the, the two major parties. And when people are disaffected and mm-hmm. casting around for a home, well, hey, you might want to check out the Libertarian Party. <laughs> it's under new management, and it's pretty good. Yeah, and that's, good. I think, what, yeah, right, right. I think that's why you say that, uh, well, if a Republican, you know, like Thomas Massey or Rand Paul ran, I'd like to tell everybody to back I'd off, dissolve the man, party, literally. He, yeah. I wouldn't see the point. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, but yeah, I, I mean, again, we might be far afield, but I— I don't know if that's completely off topic that uh, what we're look what most people out here are looking for is something different than the people that control us. And those people largely come from the machinery 
of the Democratic Party and to an extent, uh, certainly at the national level, the Republican Party. Uh, now, the local level, the Republicans have a real hard time getting in anywhere, <laughs> any place that I've lived. So true. And uh, as I look at the clock, I think we should wrap this up. So let me wrap it up with one of our catchphrases here at Natural Order Podcast, which is to put not your faith in politics and government, my friends, because it is poison. Yes, we need togetherness and groups and organizations and structure and rules, but it is better to not look to a monopolist to provide those things. It's dumb. Yeah, we're going to have to tighten up that catch. Oh, yeah. <laughs> catch the green fire. I love that green fire, Bran. I don't know what it is. <laughs> Yeah. All right, uh, folks, we will be back with you next week with another exciting episode of Natural Order Podcast. And for Adam Heyman, I am Brian O'Leary signing off. Good day. Good day. For more, head on over to naturalorderpodcast.com. For today's show notes, head over to naturalorderpodcast.com, ep11. That's naturalorderpodcast.com slash ep11.